thanks, Adam, and thanks for having us on today. I think we're all been on this um, journey with the new academic building at Murdoch University for three to four years now, some of us. So, um, yeah, it's great to see it all uh, coming to life on site. So um, my name's Ed Berry. I am a principal at Lyons and we're architects out of Melbourne. Um, we work, uh, we do a lot of work in the tertiary education space, so doing buildings for universities. Um, and the new academic building is the first project for us at Murdoch University in Western Australia. Um, and so we were approached about three or four years ago to develop a bit of a master plan for the university around moving from traditional teaching spaces of a lecture theatre uh, hosting, you know, two to 300 people uh, and then smaller tutorial rooms of, you know, say 15 to 20 people, so very large and then very small spaces, to spaces that support um, a more contemporary teaching style, which is moving towards spaces of a medium size, so 60 seats, 90 seats, all in a large flat floor environment so that students can work in what, what's called a bit of a seminar mode. So they're working in groups or they're working in, um, in teams or in sessions where you have a bit of, you listen to the lecturer for 15 minutes and you work on group work yourself for 15 minutes and you, you flip between those two modes. So that really called for a bit of a rethink at, at Murdoch University. Um, but also the other thing with Murdoch University, which is quite unique, it has a very strong architectural style. So um, it, was, uh, it was built during the sort of the 70s and it's had um, quite a sort of a, a distinct style through its whole um, development. Uh, so we we're really conscious of that, um, almost like this regional uh, language that had been developed there at Murdoch University. So we looked at a number of options of scale of building, you know, a smaller, taller building or uh, a longer, uh, lower building. And, and if you know the building at the moment, it is, it's a very long building. It's, um, it spans north, south, um, between sort of uh, the road access at the south all the way up to the student spaces at the north. So it's, it's over sort of 150 metres long in the end uh, with a large roof uh, canopy. And so what started to develop there was this quite um, sort of simplistic, repetitive structure uh, that marched up the hill of this part of the campus. And so um, it's sort of became an opportunity that we wanted to investigate, which was looking at, well, maybe, you know, mass engineered timber could be a, uh, a fantastic opportunity here. Um, geometrically, the building is, is quite linear. Uh, then there's elements of repetition in that, but it also has this really interesting massive scale to it. So, you know, the idea of, uh, you know, really large beams and, and, timber columns and then you know large roof on display was something that we were really interested in and I suppose coupling that with you know Perth's fantastic environmental advantage of you know really mild you know warm weather um, you know using outdoor space uh, a lot during the student year mild winters um, it's particularly when you know under sort of shaded uh, canopies um, uh, sort of during the, the wetter times. So, look, all that led towards us talking to the university about you know, considering timber. And we had a really um, great response from Murdoch University. So, they were looking at this building to kind of set a bit of a flag for their vision of teaching and learning, you know, going forward. Um, as I said, you know, it's a pretty new university, um, but its teaching spaces. Uh, were more traditional. So both in a pedagogical sense, so in how spaces are designed for teaching, they're interested in moving that forward, uh, but also in a uh, sort of an environmental uh, and technological sense. So um, the idea of exposing the timber and um, I suppose, you know, uh, celebrating uh, timber uh, was something that university was really keen to do. Uh, even to the point where we, tried to work with the local uh, industry, um, local, you know, in Western Australia there to see whether um, anything could be done there to start to supply uh, product locally. So, you know, it's, a, it's an industry that's right on the cusp of, um, 
exploding, I think, from a supply perspective and, and out east. We're based in Melbourne, so there's you know, pretty limited sort of supply, but what supply there is locally is um, is in hot demand at, at the moment. So it does feel like it's a really, this building's come along at a really interesting time uh, for mass engineered timber in Australia. Yeah, absolutely. And there's yeah plenty of suppliers, new ones coming online, which is going to hopefully fulfill a bit of that demand. I'd like to uh, move over to you, yourself, Pratik, um, and... Uh, First off, start with an introduction of yourself and then move on to the, the structural system that was chosen for the building and maybe just chat a, you know, a little bit about the stability. Ed was just mentioning it's a long, skinny building. Obviously, mm-hmm. that might have some of its challenges as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Pratik Shrestha. Uh, I'm an associate at Oricon uh, and I'm the lead structural engineer on this new academic building. Um, so as Ed has said, uh, we've been on this journey for the better part of three years now. Um, and it feels like time's flowing by. You know, we've had a lot of fun working on this job. Um, uh, one of the first things we noticed when we first saw the the, the landscape or the architectural renders uh, initially was just how long the building was. It's just this very skinny, very long building. Um, so I guess that in itself provided an engineering challenge of how do we stabilize this system. Um, and on top of that, the the vision was to have this um, that sort of open, flowing sort of university where. It's, it's, it's a destination rather than um, a, a, a university where students come in into a, a sort of like a concrete bunker of a lecture theater and they leave. And, and you know, especially in a time like this where a lot of lectures are online, um, the, the, the enticement piece of the university to make it a, an open flowing university that is uh, very porous was a big, big part of the design. Um, so, uh, you know, having a lateral stability element everywhere wasn't something that was desirable, but at the same time, um, showcasing some of the timber in terms of some of the bracing systems that we have uh, and finding that fine balance. So in order to stabilize the structure, um, uh, as, as is traditionally done, we do have some lift shafts that we were able to use, but we coupled that with a dual system of a timber brace system as well. Um, and that worked quite well in terms of stabilizing the structure from a lateral stability sense. From a gravity um, a structural system, uh, as Ed had mentioned before, it's a pretty regular sort of grid, and, and that's the beauty of timber. As, as, um, but as everyone on this call knows, is you do something on one grid and you sort of repeat it over and over again. And uh, you know, we sat with Ed early on, and we we said, okay, so what? A, how do we design that so that it's designed for manufacturers of the DFMA sort of uh, um, uh, language, I guess, in terms of. Let's make sure the spans are what comes out of the factory. Let's make sure that everything's within the limits and ma- making sure it all works. And, um, you know, one of the other challenges on this job was uh, having large span spaces. Uh, and one of them is, is the, the striking feature that we'll have on this project, which is the Northern Portal, which we'll probably t- touch on later on on this, on this conversation, um, achieving that. And we also have some big lab spaces down on ground floor uh, and, and achieving transfer structures and how we looked at solving some of those um, so yeah, those are just some of the engineering sort of thought behind how we got to the stability of the system and the gravity design. Mm. But yeah, it's, it's been an absolutely fun challenge and you know, seeing the timber, we've been staring at the timber uh, on, the, uh, on the computer for the past three years and just seeing it arrive on site now and just being able to touch it and feel it and just see it all come together. It's just, a, just an amazing feeling. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Jamie from multiplex so yeah love for you to also introduce yourself and uh your role in the project and yeah following that i mean what were the the areas of focus when you're going into a mass timber project at the start i mean you know fire testing i imagine when you're looking to expose so much timber and compliance and the supply chain all the way out west i mean what yeah to start by telling us a little bit about what you know the challenges for you were focuses were at the start yeah. Hi, Adam. Uh, and all. Uh, so my name is Jamie Cook. I'm a senior design manager at Multiplex. Uh, so Multiplex's role was uh, to come in during the early, we were selected during the early contractor involvement phase um, to, to come and be part of that. So by that point, Ed and Pratik and, and the team had worked really well with the client um, to bring the, bring the design to um, sort of that schematic design phase. And we really were then part of trying to, you know, add our constructability, um, put the program around uh, the installation um, and add our add our sort of smarts to it um, in terms of the logistics and, and that supply chain as we went through. So it was a little bit of an interrupted um, 
uh, ECI phase with uh, some COVID lockdowns in the middle of it. Um, but uh, we um, we really took on board that principle of trying to celebrate the timber, as as Ed put it, um, and looked to try and identify ways that we could try and reveal the timber. And I think one of the um, one of the items that will um, be a, a fantastic feature of this building is the exposed timber soffits in the in most areas, including the uh, the roof, the CLT roof uh, that we're, we'll be able to achieve. Um, we also work really closely with the supply chain to try and identify how we could minimise the risks associated with um, timber installation. We uh, we work very closely with the um, the supply chain to identify you know some of the key risks, and, and that includes the the program around the installation. Obviously, um, we were um, keen to try and land the installation of the timber to take place in the in the summer months, which is uh, where where we're at now. And as Pratik said, we're Glad to see the timber uh, starting to uh, arrive and be installed on site. Um, so that was that was a key feature of uh, of our input was to try and uh, make sure that we're installing during those those summer months. But uh, to come into your point on the on the fire testing in particular, there was already a lot of work that had been done um, through the by the fire engineer and working with DFES uh, on the expectations around timber. And um, I mean, it is still a, a relatively new building material for you know these mid-sized buildings like we have at the new academic building for Murdoch. So um, taking that work that had already been done by the fire engineer, we then worked through the design to, to really just try and simplify those fire compartments so that we minimise the penetrations through the CLT slabs. Um, the, the overall um, timber had by that stage had already been um, endorsed uh, and approved through the FER. But in terms of the fire penetrations, that was a real... Uh, challenge for us and a real risk uh, for the project was working through. So by getting the majority of those fire penetrations contained to those, you know, specific rises or the concrete areas uh, of the project where we have, you know, something in the order of about 30% of the structure is concrete and 30% is timber. Um, that way we're able to use those existing and approved passive fire certificates um, in that, in that circumstance. So, so that was another drive um, to overcome that challenge for the project. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and the fourth and final person we got in this call is uh, Mario. So we'll move over to you now and a bit of an introduction. And Jamie was just mentioning how uh, critical for their role is getting the program right. And, uh, you know, from your point of view as supplier, you got the DFNA principles. So firstly, designing for manufacture to make sure it's easy to push through the factory. And then, of course, uh, designing for assembly as well. So making sure Jamie and the Multiplex team and installers can uh, put it together as quickly as possible. So, yeah, can you tell us a bit about your con contribution in that space of DFMA? Yes, uh, yes, uh, I'm Mario Busoli from Islam Dolomiti, a uh, timber engineer. I'm working as a timber engineer here at, at Islam. And uh, basically, we joined the design team later on. Um, it's on roughly one year since we joined in, in the design. We started from the structural design that Towercon has uh, has made, basically, and try to uh, optimize it to in a in a view also of transports and uh, and manufacturing, as uh, as you already said. And yeah, a very important thing I uh, think I think in this kind of project is the design for manufacturing and assembly, because there were so many uh, different suppliers involved in this in this project that without a uh, uh, tight schedule of the elements and the properties of the element, a kind of uh, approach like the, the beam approach, basically. Uh, it would have been impossible to transfer all the information and the, the properties, the CNC capabilities of each supplier to everyone. So we, we followed that uh, part as well. We designed the 3D model, the whole building with uh, the correct properties and uh, the correct uh, CNC tolerances and uh, basically telling uh, everyone who would supply what, when, and if anything is, it has to be pre-installed, if it has to be pre-installed or not. And that was a, quite of a big challenge as well, because we, as, as we are now, we are all around the world. And so it's, it's kind of hard to uh, trans be sure that all the information are transferred properly and, uh, and so on. Also, one other, uh, great uh, thing that this kind of approach uh, has is the takeoff of the quantities 
In fact, everything has been modeled since uh, every screw, every dowel, every plug. And so the quantity takeoff has been made uh, uh, faster and uh, uh, in a more precise way. This, I think that this kind of approach helped a lot throughout the design. And so that was, that was a great thing. Yeah, I'd probably second that point, Mario. Like, I think it was really interesting. Um, like, I've been in working in Revit as an architect for 15 years, but I reckon this is the first project I've been on where Revit is really starting to deliver yeah. that um, that BIM capability. So, you know, we were getting Mario's model, uh, you know, regularly. We'd get, a, you know, fortnightly updates and we could link that straight into our model. And so then it made all those sort of, the, the checking of geometry all very quick and intuitive um, but it also was really important because obviously everything is pre-manufactured we're exposing the frame everywhere so every joint every connection is all visible so you obviously you have a lot of challenges on those connections you know you've got uh, metal plates metal screws that all need to be fire rated but they need to be fire rated in a way that uh, that looks great and doesn't detract from the, the look of the timber. So look, I, I really think the, um, the 3D modeling uh, in preparation for the manufacturer was, um, was a very important part of the process. And uh, yeah, I, I thought it was really interesting too. It was great. Yeah, no, if I may, a big shout out to Mario really, because um, as Mario said, we have, I think, three different suppliers um, on this project. And uh, as it is within the timber industry, uh, every supplier has their own, uh, in terms of uh, design for manufacture, their own tolerances, their own machining capabilities. So Mario had the enormous task of collating all of that uh, and making sure that all of the all of that information was captured accurately on 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 whoever's going to providing what timber and what plates were going where. So the ma massive, uh, uh, along with the engineering challenges that Mario was facing, yeah. I think it was a massive logistical challenge that um, that was, yeah, I think a big shout out to Mario for that one. Yeah, it, it really did take a, a big collaborative effort um, across all all the parties involved, from you know the architect, the structural engineer, the um, the suppliers, the builder, all the way through, um, uh, even even down to uh, you know the services uh, design where we have um, fire sprinklers uh, pipe penetrating through some of the glue and beams. So we needed that modelled in Mario's uh, very detailed model in the exact location so that we can make sure that we're fabricating it um, appropriately and pre-drilling it prior to it uh, being delivered on site um, where we're finding it's ex exactly in the right position um, for our sprinklers to be installed. I, thanks to everyone. And yeah, also I think maybe I forgot the, the clash detection. It's a, it's, it was a very important thing of this kind of model because we could achieve, uh, we could look into, as uh, Edward said, the model check uh, if there's any clash from a structural point of view, from an architectural or uh, uh, the fire penetration were in the right position. And uh, having such a detailed model, yeah, I think is the most important things in this kind of building because there's so many uh, different uh, actors involved in the building and so many different elements that without a very detailed model, it would be impossible to achieve a, a, good, a good solution, a good uh, result. Maybe. Yeah. And Mario, I think what made it even more complex is we, um, you know, this is a timber building, but we do have some discrete elements that are concrete and we have pretty yeah. complex geometries and the concrete structures that we have on the project. So the tolerance and the interfaces and yeah. the connection systems um, and the sequencing, that was, that was quite a challenge as well. I think, I think again, um, the, the entire team sort of came together and and with multiplexes input as well i think uh, we over, we are, we have overcome quite a lot of that which is which is quite good yeah also as you you were saying the, the early involvement of the suppliers and the team because we spent almost uh, one year discussing together looking to every solution so it it's been a quite a long time but the early involvement of the uh, suppliers the the installers, it was the, the what probably also uh, had a huge impact in the in a good result of this project. Absolutely, and I'm interested, Mario and Pratik, yeah. like, oh, and you know, Pratik, you're the lead structural engineer. You got a range of suppliers with their own products. They've got their own teams of engineers. I mean, how was that dynamic? And um, you know, were there challenges in in sort of getting the scope right? Uh, and drawing the bounds earlier, or you know, you know, can you tell us a little bit about that that process? 
Yeah, definitely. Um, so when we started on this journey uh, with Ed uh, and Murdoch, um, the, early on, um, we, we knew it was going to be timber, but we, we knew that um, you know, timber could come from Europe, it could come from New Zealand, it could come from the Eastern States, or it could come from Western Australia. So one of the things we did early on was um, try to scratch the surface a little bit more in terms of a local supply and what that would mean and how that would go about. Um, uh, you know, uh, uh, admittedly, um, when we compare the Western Australian timber industry to the European the timber industry, the timber industry, uh, the scale is much larger. Uh, and um, but the Western Australian timber industry is is really coming up um, really fast um, behind the um, behind the team there. Um, so one of the first tasks we did was we held um, what we'd like to call like a, a timber forum here in Western Australia. We invited all of the local timber suppliers and the manufacturers and basically said, you know, how do we unpack a problem of building a, a 16,000 square meter timber structure um, using a local industry? And we learned a lot from the local industry in terms of what sizes are available, what sort of program is available, um, and some of the challenges and the pitfalls and opportunities there were out there to, to uh, look at Western Australian timber, then Eastern States timber, then European timber as well. So when we were designing it, we had that in mind in terms of we wanted to keep it a bit open um, uh, without locking into one particular solution of we'll definitely go down this line, we'll definitely go that line. So keeping the, the and, and as it is, the sizes are different depending on where we get the timber from. So again, keeping that uh, spatial arrangements uh, relatively flexible and open during the design phases. Um, and when Mario came on board, um, you know, during our documentation, we had provided some uh, indicative connections of here's what we could work with. Um, but when Mario came on board, it was an absolutely, you know, it was a great symbiosis. I think it was just great having Mario and the team on board and including the Hess team and the Ash team as well, who are uh, a very important part of the project. Of, um, it was extremely collaborative. I think that's, that's probably the best way to say it. In terms of scope differences, I think um, we all sort of knew what was involved uh, and everyone sort of chipped in and it was all hands on deck in terms of solving the, um, the, the leftover connections. I think the connection design itself is it's not so much to be resolved, but just to be solved from a supplier perspective. So what's what's the CNC capability? What connection work was what, what, what sort of timber is being supplied? So I think um, coming together as one and, and solving it all together was, it was just seamless. Like it did not cause any issues or anything. and communication was always open, always helpful. And yeah, again, yeah, props to Mario and the Hess team and Ash to, it was just an amazing experience overall. Yeah. Thank you, Pratik. Yeah, it was, it was great having uh, this, this team supporting you. We, we just uh, went through every detail, every connection. We discussed about as the tolerances, the what's best for in, for each beam, for each connection, because uh, yeah, as a, Pratik was probably uh, mentioning earlier, we have uh, a lot, it, since it's a post and beam uh, building, it's true that it's very modular. We have this kind of uh, uh, frame on every grid, but we have also a braced system on which uh, eight different elements collide in one point, And we had to figure it out how to connect all the elements into a singular point. So it has also very, uh, difficult uh, details to look into and uh, having the whole team working on it, it was really, really helpful. Yeah. Jamie, move, and on to you, mate. Uh, you say, Mario, eight, eight members to one point or eight, yeah. eight elements into one point. Yeah. So I guess putting it, you know, helping work with the installers, Jamie, did you minimize uh, unwanted surprises on site or was there the certain things being ironed out? Um, and also interested to hear Ed, Ed's uh, take on you know getting it ready for installation. Yeah, now those uh, those brace bays that uh, Murray's referencing are particularly challenging. Uh, and uh, it was one thing to solve it for the uh, permanent condition. Uh, of course, we also needed to find a way to uh, make sure it was uh, buildable and installable in the temporary condition as well. So we spent a lot of time working through and understanding um, uh, the intent of, of what we were trying to achieve with, with those connections, working through um, with the the in installation team of how we're going to temporarily prop it. Um, and, and, and there was also another step in terms of which elements we were able to pre-install the connection into the timber prior to it actually arriving. Obviously being able to pre-install and do it in the workshop is, is much more preferred. They will, you know, somewhat modularize the system as it, uh, as it comes to, to site uh, to pre-install. So a lot of time and effort was worked in to do that. 
and that actually fed back into the the design process as well so that helped inform um, how we went on the design so that that was a key part of it I, I think another key part for us was once we had selected our suppliers for the project um, early days we brought across a um, a series of timber columns uh, and CLT members and actually did a an on-site prototype um, here in WA where and it was a fantastic exercise to uh, to undertake it um, one it gave the client the certainty around the the supply chain and, and just the quality of the timber um, and I think fair to say they were blown away with um, how, how well it's uh, come come up um, but it also gave us the the ability to iron out some of the issues that we um, we're going to face through the supply chain and the logistics, particularly about sea containers, getting items here from uh, from both Europe and Victoria, um, as well as detailing those connections that were to be pre-installed versus the ones that will be installed on site. And then I think thirdly, the other thing was it allowed our installation team to have a, a really a test run at, uh, at doing the installation of those connections. Um, and what what we did was we obviously videoed and recorded all of that installation process on our basically our three by three by three grid of uh, of timber um, and what that's allowed is the team that installed the prototype has now been able to share those learnings with the other um, teams that have come on board to help install the timber so um, we did put in place a number of items to um, to overcome um, some of the logistics and installation uh, challenges and I think I think some of that early prototyping was was key in that Yeah, I'll probably add to that too, like the um, <clears throat> this idea of a visual mock-up of bits of the building. You know, it's pretty common practice for facades, um, but I think it's uh, it's really been essential for this process. Not only for, um, as Jamie was saying, for the different you know players in the in the contractors team to come together. You know how it's going to work logistically. You've got three different timber manufacturers supplying into this one bit of the building. Um, but from a client side, uh, we found it really helpful to set expectations. You know, timber, mass engineered timber is still a pretty new product. There's not many buildings, particularly in Perth, you could take a client to and go, you know, it's going to look like this. Um, and particularly, you know, when we started this journey three or four years ago, you know, we, we really had no idea where the timber would eventually come from. You know, Pratik mentioned that we were talking local WA, local East Coast, European, you know, and there's like two or three different options in Europe about how that would be done, softwood, hardwood. So, you know, there's a sort of element of, of trust in the process that a client needs to have when embarking on this journey. Um, you know, they're not, it's not a concrete building. It's not something that, you know, the industry has been doing consistently for a hundred years. And, you know, there's very tried and tested methods and expectations there. So, um, and that's been really interesting and it comes down to the fine details you know it comes down to the jointing it comes down to the final finish on the product um you know we, we're all very aware you know we spent a lot of time even talking about um you know like the timber members will be propped during construction that'll put holes in the columns necessarily um you know so we've been talking about for like three years now how do we how do we manage that you know are there ways to prop it without doing that or when it is you know when you do screw into it temporarily how is that plugged you know in the final product and so all those things were thought through and I think it's been it was a really good that they were thought through at the time I think it's you sort of need that time to get everyone's head around what the actual implications are going to be of this whole process and particularly the client's head around it because um uh it's yeah it's something they haven't seen before um you know and wood is a natural material um and so there'll be you know variation with that within that you know color and texture and knots and grain and all that type of thing so um like any any timber uh product project there's uh there's an element of that natural variation that we um you know just all need to be confident that everyone's gonna be happy with the result and Ed, there is some external blue lamb, I understand. Uh, um, tell us about that. I mean, in terms of protecting that from a durability point of view and also the aesthetics of, of the exposed timber. Yeah, that's right. So look, that's been, you know, the showing off the timber is really one of the key drivers of the building. You know, this building um, 
will be like the new front door to the campus. So, you know, it's anticipated that you'll get thousands of students every day walking up along this building underneath the colonnade of the building. Um, so, you know, I think there, there's a strong desire to try and keep that visible uh, as much as possible. So, look, we have a really big roof on this building, which provides shelter for students as they um, walk up from the southern end of the site into the heart of the campus. Uh, so it shelters the students and it also shelters the timber. So that, that goes a long way uh, to, um, to protecting the timber. Um, we've also, with our facades, we've tried to minimise spandrel panels where we can. So all the columns, even though they're on the edge of the building, they have a glass, you know, the glass facade is clear glass in front of those columns. Uh, so that will be, you know, visible from outside or the soffits will be visible, even though you, know, you can sort of see through the windows. You know, we especially designed the sunshade so that it, they achieve their sun shading, but they allow you know, the students when they're walking up through the campus uh, to look up into the building and to, to see the timber soffits. So we've taken, um, I think, pretty much every step to try and show the timber off um, to, to the students from both inside and, and outside the building. Yeah, beautiful. And it's, yeah, such a good result. And everyone, you know, after listening to this, will go check it out on, on Google. And if you're in WA, probably lock up to Murdoch if they're allowed to. Um, well, yeah, we've had a, we've got good context of the, uh, of the projects. We might go around and just talk about some of the major challenges that, um, and lessons learned for the project, um, maybe one by one and feel free to, you know, bounce off each other on each challenges as they come up. So we might start with yourself, uh, uh, Jamie. Yeah, thanks, Adam. Um, look, I, I guess key to key to us and understanding it was was really learning the lessons from you know a number of other projects. So um, we were fortunate enough to you know use a collaborative approach and, and reach out to uh, Multiplex over in Victoria that have done the um, Latrobe project, um, but also you know in addition to the the people um, on the call at at the moment, um, and really learn from some of the the lessons that they had. Um, a lot of that was uh, that we picked up was around um, obviously the log logistics of getting materials across um, from European sea containers, uh, the right sizes, the pre-installation, um, but also, also around the moisture management. Uh, I think the three key risks that came out of uh, the trobe were water, water, and water. Um, so we've really got a, a, a part of it was to, as I said earlier, to try and install during the, the dry months in Perth, which we're fortunate enough to have, have quite a few of. Um, but also to have a plan in place for when the moisture or the rain does come, if we haven't uh, sealed up the building by that stage during the installation phase, to make sure that we've got a plan in place that is going to protect the timber um, and not allow that moisture getting trapped in zones. Um, so that's something that we're, we're taking very seriously and, and are you know, working on currently as we go through and all the way through the supply chain process from independent checks as it leaves the, the factory floors into the sea containers, sea containers as, as they are arriving in Perth. And then we're taking measurements on site as well to make sure that we've got that, that moisture um, uh, on, on track under control on site. So that's, that's been a, a sort of a, a key QA lesson that we've, we're learning and uh, hopefully Im implementing. Um, I think the other overall key one has been that, that just the early design effort, really being able to get that, um, really an LED 400 stage model with all the connections model allowed us the ability to um, de-risk some of the supply chain issues that the, I really, I think everyone is experiencing, be it um, connections, screws, steel, timber, almost every uh, material that we can uh, uh, try and get at the moment, uh, we're experiencing those procurement um, and supply chain problems. Um, so it really did allow us to define and scope correctly uh, who to uh, to get those from and and get them early so that we could lock in the pricing, lock in the procurement of them, and make sure they were ready on site. We're in a warehouse, you know, around the corner from site, so that we can install accordingly. Wonderful. My move to yourself, uh, Pratik. Yeah, uh, in terms of challenges, I think from an engineering perspective, uh, one of the first challenges that we faced uh, when we got on the job was uh, this area called the Northern Portal or the Northern Event Space, which is this 30 metre clear span uh, structure that will be used as an event space or for graduations that could potentially hold about 800 students. So that's 
How, sorry, how much probably, how clear span was it? You say 30? 30, 30, 30, yeah, yeah. Wow. 30 meter clear span. So yeah, I mean, if you I talk to your local structural engineer and say, can you design me a 30 meter clear span out of steel? Uh, they'll, you know, raise a few eyebrows and concrete, that's another whole new ball game. And then timber is something that, you know, you really have to think about um, and really have to overcome that challenge. So one of the first things Murdoch said was, we don't want a column in the middle. We want an absolutely clear span. Let's solve it together. Um, and that was, yeah, that was one of the first, first things we needed to solve. And it was, as Ed knows, there's lots of sleepless nights trying to solve that. How, how is it going to work? How are the connections going to work? What's the sensitivity to deflections? What sort of wind loads do we need to do? And then the, the additional challenge was this northern portal is, is connected to the rest of the building, which has uh, column lines through the middle. So what's the sensitivity to deflection there? Um, and what is going to be the cross fall? So that, 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 was a, that was a fun challenge to solve. And um, we, we carried out endless sort of sensitivity checks to you know, using pin supports through to spring supports through to taking into consideration the stiffness of the connections, making a stiff connection, making a very um, uh, 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 sort of uh, using spring stiffnesses in the connections to account for the rotation that we're going to get in the connection. Um, and then using uh, the, the various timber elements, their own stiffness values and seeing what sort of uh, behavior we're going to get. Um, and, you know, strength uh, in the timber was never going to be a problem. It was going to be deflections and, and sensitivity to deflections over time. Uh, so that was that was probably the biggest challenge for us. And uh, we were able to uh, solve it and, and achieve a great outcome for the client. And I think, uh, as you said, Adam, uh, if people are in WA, um, uh, and when the university does open, I think that's one of the biggest striking features of the university is please come and visit and it's going to be awesome seeing that Northern portal and, uh, and solving that Mario uh, had a big hand in that as well in terms of getting the connection stiffnesses to work out, as well as the Hess team and the Ash team as well. So uh, again, a fantastic collaborative effort to, to bringing the client's idea and, and Ed's vision to life as well uh, and, and achieving this awesome, awesome span. Um, and in terms of uh, other challenges, I guess, um, I, I wouldn't say challenges, but I think an opportunity on future projects, and we talked about this just before about the visual mock-up. Um, I think it's, you know, we look at drawings, we look at models all day, every day, nothing quite beats just getting your hands dirty and just building something. And I think in a timber world, building a visual mock-up of a three by three grid or whatever it is, it's, it's just something really cool about it. Yeah, I remember when um, uh, we walked in, when the, the VMU or the visual mock-up was built, everyone just gravitated towards the timber. Everyone just wanted to touch it just the way it is. And you get an early taste and appetizer for it. And the additional benefit, Jamie might be able to talk about this, is that we were able to do additional acoustic testing onto it or how the facade connects to it or just simple things um, that even though everyone knows how to screw a screw fixing into a timber, just doing it is just just a different sort of um, uh, perspective to it. So I think that's probably something for future projects. If the opportunity arises, definitely doing a, a visual mock-up. Yeah, ab absolutely. Just to jump in on that, a, a number of our other uh, you know, design team and, and trades have been out to see the visual mock-up as well, purely to, to see what they'll be um, uh, dealing with. And, and it is amazing to see uh, how quickly people walk over and they'll run their hands along the timber. It's just a, it's a, that natural product. Everyone just, if you stand back, you, you'll see it every single time um, that they do it. But it has, it's true. We're, we've got a sub access floor. So we've tested the installation of how that works. We've done acoustic tests on, on it to make sure that the, um, uh, the noise transmission through um, the timber is going to be suitable, given that we're clearly dealing with academic spaces and, um, uh, you know, don't want that noise transfer all the way through. Um, all the way down to yeah, probably more the uh, you know the mechanics of fi uh, fixings and doing pull-out tests to make sure we've got the right connections for a timber product uh, or a timber building as opposed to a typical concrete or steel. So it's it's been a fantastic um, uh, idea that we've followed through uh, that concept that was that was put forward and it's had so many benefits to the the project overall. So funny that everyone hugging columns when they're walking past it for timber buildings for some reason. Um, Mara, you've you've supplied a few buildings within Australia now from XLM Dollar Media being an uh, overseas supplier. I mean, what what sort of lessons learned from from your end um, that you can take out of this, and what were the challenges for you as well? I mean, elephant in the room being COVID, which I don't think it was on the table for when it was yeah started, but, but mostly yeah, yeah tra <laughs> transport because uh, as you mentioned. Uh, we, we have to ship uh, the, the CLT panels from the other side of the world, basically. And so it, transport has a huge impact both on uh, costs and uh, times. 
So we had to carefully plan the, the containers, how to, uh, how to um, fill them. And also uh, a huge, uh, in this kind of, in this project, particularly the grid, the structural grid has the, a huge impact since we have six meter span on each grid and the containers are, are like 12.03 uh, centimeters. So we wasn't sure until the very end if we could fill the 12 uh, meter long uh, CLT floors into the container, and that would have uh, uh, would have had a huge impact in the in the supply of the panels. Finally, we managed to uh, fill the containers with 12 meters, so it was a, a great achievement. But yeah, the, the structural grid has a huge impact in the in the in the transportations, and uh, also another challenge as a. Uh, uh, all the, as Edward uh, was saying before, is that every element is uh, visual, basically. Uh, there's like, just to give you some rough numbers, there's like six, 16,000 uh, square meters of CLT exposed and uh, 1,000 and a half uh, cubic meters of glula. And I think that all the elements are exposed. We don't have any surface covered apart from the top side of the CLT, of course. And that's uh, a big challenge because we have to, carefully think uh, how to transport them, how to protect them, but also uh, how to uh, make any connection that uh, will be uh, good to see, because basically every connection is exposed from a visual point of view. And so that was a, a, a great challenge as well. Really, there's, uh, there's, a, lot, yeah, there's a lot in that, in that magic 12 meter grid. Yeah. <laughs> You got your continuous span, so it helps in that sense. It helps from a supplier's point of view, robustness. It just, it's uh, it really is a sweet spot we're finding on yeah a lot of projects. Yeah. Um, and Edward, moving to you for yeah, lucky last. Uh, uh, I guess you got the, you can really take your pick on <laughs> some of your challenges <laughs> and lessons yeah. learned. Drill down yeah. to what's come up or uh, enter something new. I think it's a really interesting um, challenge from a design team perspective in that uh, when you, you, you know, when you select timber, generally you want to show it off. Uh, so therefore the coordination of all your services um, is going to be on show, but at the same time that has to be, you know, shop drawn and, and cut in the factory. So on this project in particular, and I think it'd be similar on, you know, most projects, you know, we're still, working out how to hold the building up. We don't have necessarily shop drawings of, of services, you know, progressed in that normal way. And you're trying to then commit to penetrations all the way through the building that you, know, you want to all be, you know, millimeter perfect and cut in the factory and, and looking fantastic. So I think that is, I think from a, I suppose, just a scheduling perspective, You've just it's you got to turn it upside down from what a traditional concrete building would be, and I, I feel like that's that's something that the industry will take. Maybe everyone will do it one project. <laughs> It'll take them to work that out. Um, you know, I think we've all learned our, that lesson here on this project. Um, and but sometimes there's just challenges with procurement generally. You know, I think uh, uh, COVID and a whole lot of other issues. You know, um, have brought challenges to projects at the moment. So look that was the biggest challenge from our perspective that um, things were happening out of, out of the traditional sequence. And so a lot of assumptions were needing to be made all the way along, but at the same time, you know, we're having very high standards aesthetically of what we want to try and achieve. So, you know, you couldn't just leave oversized big, you know, gaps in, uh, in areas to, to run future services through. So um, yeah, I think that's the, that's the, overall challenge or, or just difference in, in a timber building but then mitigating that by you know the high level of, of BIM documentation you do get from uh, you know a, a timber cater uh, and working in this kind of really classic DNC manner you know like all the all the columns every column and beam change size from the design engineering uh, stage to the fabrication um, so that that theoretically would be actually really difficult to manage um, but that was made much simpler a because they all got smaller which was pretty good um, but but b because of that that constant um, contact with the, the the virtual building the model online so we're able to manage that and good loop back to a bit earlier in the discussion having that uh, sort of 
you know, that BIM management uh, on point at the start to LED 400. So there's no uh, yeah, surprises at the end. Um, yeah, well, it's been wonderful speaking to you all. And uh, obviously you got a really great culture in your project team and that's why the project's been so successful. So um, thank you for so much for coming on the podcast. And uh, is there anything else anyone wants to leave us with before we uh, before we knock this one off? I think just from an architectural perspective, um, this project is, what is it? We've got another project on site at the moment that's using um, CLT and other mass engineered timber um, technologies. I, I feel like from an architectural perspective, uh, this is definitely, we're going to be playing in this space for a lot of buildings moving forward. You know, we focus on larger projects and so it's taken them a little bit longer to get into the, the engineered timber space because of all the technical issues, fire, acoustics, regulatory uh, challenges, uh, scale, you know, um, being able to get uh, enough timber in the right timeframes uh, for these kind of big, big public projects. But um, yeah, I think it's going to be a really, uh, really interesting future for the timber industry. And it's, it's very exciting and it's great to be, I think, involved in one of the earlier projects. I know there's a number of timber projects around now, but certainly at this scale, this is going to be a bit of a, a benchmark, I think, for large scale uh, timber university buildings in Australia. Mm -hmm.